All right, guys, we're going to talk about something really cool, really awesome, and really important. I believe it's the first of the collection classes that uh, we have hit this semester. What is a collection class? It's something that can contain data in a way that's hopefully more efficient, and gives you extra abilities than arrays. Now, arrays have their pluses, chief of which is that they're just about the fastest way to access data especially in a language where the array is allocated entirely contiguously. And I'm not quite sure that that's the case in Java. But in C++, for example, when you ask for an array of 100 elements, it goes and it grabs a block of memory for 100 elements. And I believe Java is the same way. So stepping through the array is lickety-split. The memory is already you know, cached. It's all ready to access. Getting a piece of data is a simple matter of the... Uh, of the processor doing a math calculation, going to that address and pulling the data in. With a collection, it's not quite as fast, but on the other hand, speed is not everything, especially if the other things give you much better capabilities. For example, there are things called dictionaries, also known as mappings. The first one we're going to talk about is the array list. The array list can be a replacement for arrays. It's just way better than arrays in many, many ways. Why? Arrays are static, meaning that once you allocate, they stay the same size no matter what. You allocate something 10 elements long, you want to put an 11th element, too bad. You have to go to considerable trouble to get that to happen. You have to create a brand new array, copy all the old elements into it, and then you can start adding new elements to it. Similarly, if you want to delete something from the middle of the array, that's a problem as well. You would either have to allocate an array that was one element smaller and then copy all the elements into it, excluding the one that you want deleted, or you could just push up everything, you know, copy all the elements one by one to fill in the gap that you want, yeah, you don't want to do that. You want to use an array list. Array lists are dynamic, meaning that they expand and contract as required, which is really, really, really useful. You want to insert something in the middle of it, no problem. You want to pin something, great. You want to delete something from it, awesome. All that just happens cleanly without any extra work on your part, just a simple method call. So they expand and contract as necessary. You can append, insert, and delete from them. So arrays are static. Once you allocate them, they stay the size no matter what. Stay the same size, which makes Append, insert, and delete automatic, um, problematic. Deleting elements, I should say. You can always delete the entire array just by setting, it, setting its reference to null. Once you set a reference to null, the garbage collector will come and delete it. Let's mention that just for a second. Say you do this, int IA is equal to you know, 1, 2, 3. If later on you go ahead and do this, IA equals null, then now nothing is pointing to this memory, unless you've set another reference variable to point to it as well. The garbage collector will notice that and remove it. Or, you know, if this is inside a block of code, you know, int foo, like that, then once foo is done running, this variable disappears because it's out of scope. The array is still in memory. But now there are no pointers to that memory, so it wipes it out. So the garbage collector is a very useful thing because you do not have to manage memory in the way that old C programs would need to, where you had to allocate things and then you absolutely had to deallocate things, free that memory, and if you did not, your program would get a memory leak, meaning that it would expand its usage of memory until it used up the entire computer's amount of RAM. Firefox used to be notorious for its uh, memory leaks. You know, if you left Firefox, the browser running, you know, for 
five, six days, you'd come back and you'd find out that it was using a vast amount of memory. They pretty much fixed that. Okay, so how do you allocate an array list? Well, let's come look. So the array list class provides the same basic functionality that comes with a standard array, plus it provides additional functionality. So the basic functionality, the array list stores an ordered collection of values, just like an array. It allows access to the values via subscript, via index. Slightly different syntax, but it's the same idea. If you want the first element, you ask for, you know, element zero. If you want the second one, you ask for element one. However, it grows and shrinks dynamically by inserting and deleting elements at any specified location. So it's defined in the Java's API's java.util package. So you're going to have to import in order to get it to work. Now NetBeans makes that ridiculously easy, right? But you know you can always go and add the import by hand, especially if you're using an editor that does not do it automatically. You could import java.util.arraylist, or you could always just import java.util.asterisk. Get them all, right? whole bunch of things. I believe the scanner class is defined in java.util as well. Why not get the scanner class and the ArrayList class in one fell swoop by importing that package? So to initialize it, here's the syntax. And if I type it out, it's going to look a lot clearer than what it looks there. It looks like this. Array list integer type, I mean a uh, data type. Well, let's say array list of strings. Then you have to give it a name. I'm going to call it sal for string array list equals new array list. It's still a type string, but it knows that based on the fact that you did that. So we don't have to put anything between those angles. And then since we're calling new, just like when you create a new scanner or something like that, you have to put the parentheses in there to, to finish the invocation of the new constructor, of the constructor for that class. So that's how you do it. What if you wanted to create a, an array of scanners, excuse me, an array list of scanners? It'd be ridiculous, but you could do that. Absolutely no need to ever do this, right? Not that I can think of, right? There, right? That would be in a new. That would be a, a new array list. What if you want to create an array of integers? Array list integer IAL equals new array list. And okay, it's a little bit more complicated than creating an array. But notice you don't have to specify a size, right? With an array, you have to create a maximum size that you expect the data to occupy. And if you don't make it large, large enough then you have a problem, and if you make it too large, you have wasted memory that your program's using. It's nice to be able to do it this way. So your data type goes between the angle braces. That's the key thing to remember. Notice, though, that I did not use INT. Why is that? Array lists work with reference types, not primitive values. So we're going to have to use integer with a capital I rather than lowercase int. We're going to have to use the wrapper class double with a capital D rather than the primitive type double with a lowercase d. So it's got to be like that. Or if we want an array list of doubles, right, we would put double between the angle braces. Like that. Again, capital D. Key point. Array lists require reference types. In other words, classes. And whoops, this has been slightly off your screen. I apologize for that. I'll just bring it right back on there. All right, so array lists require reference types, meaning you cannot use primitive types, which are the numeric types, such as int, float, long, boolean, care. You can use strings, though. A string is not a primitive type, even though we've been using it since day one. It's not a primitive type. How do you know that? It begins with an uppercase letter rather than a lowercase letter. All the data types that begin with a lowercase letter are the primitives, right? The numeric primitives. Even a character is fundamentally a numeric type just because it represents a number, you know, in the Unicode character set. 
and a Boolean is just a number, ultimately. Right, zero for false, one for true. All right, so int float long double Boolean care. I can't think of any more primitive data types, but I'm sure there are. Instead, you use the wrapper classes, integer with a capital I, float with a capital F, long with a capital L, double with a capital B, Boolean with a capital B, Okay, I forget if it's character or just capital C. I almost never use the character class. Anyways, and then of course string. And these are probably the most common things that you use on array list for, especially in the beginning. But you can also use your own classes. Once you make a class, you know, you make a class called animal, you can make an array list filled full of animals. Array list support polymorphism by using, by allowing inheritance. That'll be the topic for the next chapter. So, you cannot use primitive types such as those. Instead, use reference types like those. And any other class. All right. Let's actually get to using some. So then we can see how to insert items into it, right? Access the elements out of it, stuff like that. So I'm going to make a new project. I believe we're on lecture O. So, lecture O. Go ahead and create a main class, right? I mean, if you're using ant, if you're not using ant, if you're using, you know, you know how to handle it, adding a class for yourself if you need to. But we're not creating a JFrame application, so we definitely want a main class in there, however you want to create it. I don't want to package though, so I'm going to delete the package. So right off the bat, I'm going to go ahead and add my import statement. Import Java dot util dot. Why not just asterisk? In case we're going to use a scanner or the array list class, which we're going to do. All right, let's create some array lists, just like we did before. I'm going to create an array list called names, so that we can insert some names into it. So it needs to be an array list of strings. Right, array list angle strings in the angle names, or I could call it name list, right? Equals new array list. We, whoops, why did I put an S there? Because you say it's an array list of strings, but it's really an array list of type string. There you go. Equals new array list. I could put string here as well, but I don't have to because the compiler figures it out based on the fact that I'm asking for an array list of string right there. Then we could add some things to it, right? Names dot add. What are our names? Anakin. Star Wars is on my brain. New movie coming up, huh? Names dot add. Add somebody else, right? Oh, come on. There we go. Accidentally entered insert mode. So it was going into auto strike. All right, we're going to add a new name, right? Han. And names dot add, you know, parentheses, quote, Tarkin. If you don't know these names, who cares, right? Just taking some data in them. All right, and then if we print the list out, it might not look that great. It might just print a reference to the array list. Unlike Python, where if you, yeah. By the way, an array list is the exact equivalent of what a list is in Python. If you recall hearing that Python doesn't support arrays, it only supports lists, well, that's because the inventor of Python decided that since array lists were so much more awesome than arrays, why even bother making arrays? So he just called them lists rather than array list. Same idea. 
Okay, so I've added three things to it. Let's print it out. By the way, this is not going to work. It's just going to print out a reference, an address, right? A hashed value. So system.out.println parentheses names. Sure would be nice if that worked. It's not gonna. Let's give it a shot. So I click the green arrow. I'm running a slow machine, so it takes a while. Oh, well, what do you know? I was totally wrong. If you print out an array, it does not print it out that cleanly, or does it? Maybe I'm getting myself confused with something else. I gotta find out. I'm gonna create an array, just a good old fashioned array of ints, right? I don't have to do this because I'm just gonna probably delete these two statements in a minute. Print. And then I'm gonna print that out system.out.print ln parentheses ia in parentheses semicolon. What's that look like? Yeah, that's what I was thinking, right? When we try to print out our array, all we got is this hashed reference to it. Not any use. But awesomely, when we printed out our array list, it had a good example. Good output, right? Why is that? Because the array list class has a toString method. We don't have to call it. It gets called automatically. Anytime that something is trying to be converted into a string, the toString method is accessed. And the toString method is intelligent and actually can dump out you know, the contents of that array list, create a string from it. So I'm going to delete my array reference. If I wanted to put toString in there to show specifically how that is being turned into a string, I could do that, but it's not necessary. So I'll delete that. All right. What if we wanted to add something into the beginning of the array? In other words, we wanted to insert it. Now, they just used the same, same method name. They just used add. They did not make a second method called insert. But you do specify the position. If you specify no position, then add doesn't append at the end. But if you do specify a position, that serves as a subscript of the new value. So, for example, if I add something into the zeroth position in the subscript zero, then the new value becomes the first element in the list and everything is pushed down by one. Let's prove that. Right? Well, these are in al alphabetical order. I cannot think of a name that begins with, you know, something earlier than A. So it's not going to be sorted anymore. That's all right. Names.add into position zero. Somebody else. Right? Why not? Luke. Luke's going to be at the head of the list. Then we can print it out again. I'm just going to copy that, paste it. That'll print it out again. run it and that add function specifying zero did in fact make that the first element if we changed it to add into subscript 2 then it will replace element 2 not replace element 2 but Luke will become the new element 2 and everything after that will get pushed down one like that right so 0 1 2 Luke became Element subscript 2, and so Targan, Targan had to step further back in line, became element 3. What if we wanted to remove something from the array? Well, let's go back to the PowerPoint. So we know how to allocate now. The syntax for allocating an array list is very similar to the syntax for creating a simple object from a class, right? except when we create the array list, 
we do something that's known as a template. We fill in a template where we specify a data type. Templates are kind of an advanced topic. I believe we will brush upon. I will make a point of doing that, but for now, just know that the syntax is slightly different because we do have to specify the data type. If you make an array list without specifying the data type, it doesn't know what you're trying to store. If you really want to do that, if you really want to create an array list and not specify a type, you could just put object there, right? Because everything is an object except for the primitive data types. But then what are you going to do, right? You call dot add, and well, it would add an object, but let's let's not go there. And here's how you create a standard array. And this did not specify. Yeah, I guess it did. Right, array list of students as opposed to an array of students. We see that there's some differences. Specifically, the use of the template syntax where you use angle braces to define your type. So, to add an element to the end of an array list, you call dot add, passing in the item. All right, so Java API. Seems this looks like a familiar slide. We've seen this before. API stands for Application Programming Interface. It's the interface to the huge library of pre-built Java classes. You don't need to know the internals of these classes. I don't know how the array list works. I have some, I have some thoughts on it. I can make some predictions, but I don't need to know how it works. I just need to know that if I call dot add, it puts something at the end. If I call dot add and specify a number, it puts it at that place. Right. We do need to know what type of arguments to pass to it and what type of value it returns. And it seems like whenever I try to access Java doc on my specific version of NetBeans here, it doesn't pop up Java doc, but I could always go to Google and Google it up. And also, as I'm typing it, the so-called IntelliSense, the little hints that come up, do tell us, you know, give us some options about some information about what kind of arguments it needs and what it returns. So to access an element within an array list, you don't quite do it the same as you do with arrays. You don't use square braces. Instead, you use dot get. So what have we seen so far? I'm just going to make a... So if the array list is named AL, Here's the syntax to add something. You just do al dot add, you know, item, whatever that item is. To insert into the middle or beginning, you use al dot add, and you specify its position, right? Zero if you're going to put it in the beginning of the list. I think I'm going to change that to x comma item, where x is the subscript of where the item will be inserted. So if x is equal to 0, it puts it at the beginning of the list. If x is equal to 1, then the beginning of the list is left untouched, but the item you're adding becomes the new number 1. So to access an element, you do this, right? Value is equal to ArrayList.Get, and you specify the index. That would be the first element. If you replace 0 with 1, it becomes the next element, right? So value equals al.get subscript x. x can be any valid subscript, any valid index. You don't really call it a subscript if it's uh, not between square braces, but the terms are so similar that I would just flip between them. Anybody you talk to who knows programming would understand if you use one or the other. Let's do that. Let's get a value out. Let's pull Luke out or you know, 
get the name of some of the people in our list of names. All right. So string s1 equals names.get c0 in parentheses. That gets the first element. String s2 equals names.get the second element. And we could print them out and we would see you know the first two elements of the list. System dot out dot print ln parentheses s1 plus quote space quote plus s2 in parentheses semicolon. You know, and we're going to see Anakin and Han, I think. I think those are, unless we change this back to a zero, right, to insert it in the beginning of the list. Insert at beginning of the list. So we will see Luke followed by Anakin because Luke is a new zero, which pushes Anakin to be in position one. And there we go, right? Position zero, dot get parentheses zero, returned Luke, dot get parentheses one, returned Anakin. And let's take a look at the methods available to us from an array list just by typing in names dot new boy. Notice there's an add all. Well, if you want to add one list to another, right, append the list to another list, you can call add all and pass in the second list that you want appended to it. Or you can insert it into a specific position just like we were doing with dot add. All right, contains, you could check to see if something contains another element. Index of, well that one's real useful. You're trying to find a specific value. We want to search that index to find out, excuse me, we want to search that list. Well, you can't see that. Yeah, I got this small screen size. I do it to make the video easy to see. Names dot, still can't see it. Anyways, there's one called index of. Let's find out the index of Tarkin. All right, so int pos position equals names dot index of parentheses quote Tarkin in parentheses end quote, in parentheses, semicolon. I'm going to try the Java doc one more time. Why don't we start hoping that it'll magically fix itself. Show Java doc. Yeah, of course not. Alrighty. Google's our friend. Array list index of. Just pick one of these at random. It returns the index of or negative one if it can't find it. Why wouldn't it return zero if it can't find it? Well, because zero is actually a valid position, right? It's a valid subscript, it's a valid index. So it returns negative one if we if we don't find it. So we could check to see if POS is equal to negative one. If Tarkin was not in the list, we'd want to know that. But let's first print out just POS. System dot out dot print ln parentheses POS equals end quote plus POS in parentheses semicolon. We could be adding comments, right? Find the index number of the array list element that equals quote target. Right, like that. That's what we're doing now. What did we do up here? We added add three or append three, add slash append three elements to our list. All right. Use dot get to access specified elements in the list. That's what we did there. All right. Let's see what POS is equal to when we pass in Tarkin. Better not equal minus one because we've seen Tarkin show up every single time we run it. Right. 
So we're pretty sure it's in the list. We've seen it. And it is, in fact, at position 3. It is at the third index. 0, 1, 2, 3. True enough. Indeed it is. What if we've misspelled it? Tarking. Right. The ultimate target. Tarkin. That's a stupid joke. Let's run it. And we will see that since Tarking is not in the list, we get a negative 1. So we could check, right? If parentheses POS equals equals negative 1, in parentheses, system.out.println element not found in list, in quote, in parentheses, semicolon. Else, System dot out dot print line parentheses element found at index space end quote plus pos in parentheses semicolon. That kind of renders this one superfluous, but it'll leave it there. All right, the element in fact was not in the list because. We look for something that was not in it. Now I remember the syntax in Python, something like this. If element in list, right, to do something. Is there a method that will return whether something is in the list or not. I mean, you could always just check to see if its return value is negative one or not. But is there something that just returns a true or false? I don't recall. Let's find out. So names dot. Uh, I'm going to scroll up and down see if I can find it. Yeah, see, I'm seeing size. If we want to count how many elements are in the list, that's useful. Set. If you want to change element zero. We don't want it, no longer want Luke to be element zero. We want Leia to be element zero. We would call dot set. Remove. Remove is pretty important to, to delete an element from the list. To array, if for some reason the code requires an array, like there's already a method that expects an array. To string, we've already used it. Trim to size. I guess if you only want three elements in your array list, you could call trim to size. Well, but you're not specifying a specific value here. So my guess is that it's truncating the memory. It's, re it's reorganizing the memory. Because what it does is it tries to be kind of efficient. And when you create a new array list, even though the array list is empty, it goes ahead and allocates some RAM to the array list size, you know, so that the first couple of appendings don't have to reallocate RAM, you know, grab new memory. And, but then as it goes on, as you insert more and more elements into it, it will have to go out and grab memory occasionally. But trim to size, probably, if I'm recalling correctly, will then tell the class to go ahead and trim it to only the absolute minimum memory required to contain the current contents. Let's find out if that's true. Array list space pin to size, or trim to size. It trims the capacity of the array list to be the list's current size. So, if your array list has four, you know, some extra memory that has been allocated. Now, if you call dot size to get the length, the class is only going to tell you one, two, three, four, five, right? Because it acts like it's only got exactly enough RAM that it needs. But behind the scenes, it's got a little bit more so that extra appendings into it will happen more efficiently. And also, if you delete some elements from the middle of the list, you know, still, it doesn't automatically remove that RAM from the end. Hope that kind of makes sense. We just treat it, though, as though the class magically expands and contracts required, you know, just behind the scenes. It, it's ma trying to manage memory a little bit more efficiently. So what if we want to remove somebody from the list? 
Oh, by the way, I didn't see an element that would a uh, method that would return true or false if it was in the list. But you can always check the index of it using index of. And if index of is equal to negative one, then you know you better not try to be doing anything else. So we're going to delete Han from the list. All right. Or Han. Seems like they call them both things in there, depending on which accent that Curry Fisher was trying to emulate. So here we go. We're going to check to see if Han is in there. So if, parentheses, names dot index of capital O, parentheses, quote, Han, in parentheses, or end quote, in parentheses, equals equals negative one. We know that it's not in the list. So instead, I'm going to check to see if it's not equal to negative one, right? Because it is in the list if the return value of index of is equal or is not equal to negative one. All right, so now let's return, excuse me. Now let's remove that element. Names dot remove parentheses. And did you notice that you can remove by two different options here? Oh, you're not gonna show me now. Come on, dot remove parentheses. Oh, you meanie. It popped up the first time, it's not doing it now. Anyways, there were two ways. You could say remove index two, and it would delete that specified position, or you can remove by value. So remove accepts, you know, remove enables you to do it both by value and both and position, which is kind of nice. So remove quote Han in quote in parentheses semicolon. And let's just print our list one more time. Make sure that element is gone. System.out.println parentheses names in parentheses semicolon. So hammer and broom and then run it. What do you get when you mix alcohol with literature? All right, if you overheard the beginning of that joke that somebody just started telling me, the joke is what do you get? When you mix literature and alcohol, and the answer was tequila mockingbird. So now you're obligated to go and tell that joke to somebody else. Let's run it. Right, so we looked for tarking. That element was not in the list. Then we looked, then we deleted, we removed, dot removed Han. So Han is no longer in the list. Although Han was earlier. What would happen if you called dot remove on something that was not actually in the list? Right. Let's find out. Names dot remove parentheses quote ABC. Now we know that element's not in the list. Let's see what happens. Hammer broom and green arrow. And it didn't do anything. Well, that's nice of it because some languages will crash if you try to remove something that does not exist. It'll and not crash, that's not the technical term. It'll throw an exception that you have to handle. Just like if you try to, in an array, access an element that doesn't exist, right? The array is 10 elements long, so you access subscript 20. It'll generate an exception. We need to jump into exception handling pretty soon. But, didn't do that. I wonder what dot .remove is supposed to return. What its return value is. Sure, it'd be nice if Java doc worked. Doesn't, so I'm going to come over here. Google that up. Return array list remove. Yeah, this doesn't say. I guess I should always use the official one. Let's go look at array list remove oracle.com. Just this is always a little bit more abstract looking. So I'm going to look at remove. Doesn't say what it returns. Oh, I think it does. It actually returns that element. That's what I'm expecting to see here. That's what I'm. That's how I'm reading that. Is that E is the element 
that was just inserted into it. I'm not totally sure that's right, but let's find out. What if we just went up here, and while we're deleting Luke, not that we have yet, let's system dot out dot print ln parentheses names dot remove parentheses quote Luke in parentheses excuse me end quote in parentheses in parentheses semicolon. So we're just going to see what the return type return value is if we do that. True. All right. That's how we know whether it functioned or not. If you try to remove something and it returns true, then it did work. But if it returns false, it did not. So down here, I'm going to delete that line. That one's a little bit too confusing to see in the notes. But I'm going to do this. Boolean OK equals names dot remove. System dot out dot print ln parentheses. Did we delete or did we remove ABC question mark space end quote plus OK. And we will find out that it prints false. It prints false because ABC is not an element in the list. And if we tried to remove somebody else, like if I change this temporary to Luke, temporary to Luke, right? I'm going to undo that change. I wouldn't recommend that you do it if you're following along. I just want to see, make sure it prints true. Yep, did we remove Luke? True. All right, now I'm going to hit undo a couple of times because I want that to say ABC. All right, let's go back and look at the PowerPoint. Or let's update our little notepad. Things we have learned so far, allocating, and then use, you know, list.add, list.get, list.remove. We haven't done set yet. Set will change the value of the element. I don't know who's at the first position anymore, but we're going to change them. The old Abbott and Costello routine, who's on first? Let's change the name to Abbott. So names dot set. And if we look at the helper here, it's saying that the index is the position that we want to set and the element is the value. So we're going to set position zero, comma, to Abbott. So whoever was at the beginning of the list has now been replaced by Abbott. If we printed out the list, we find out. Wonder what that returned. System dot out dot don't do this. I'll probably immediately undo it. But that'll tell me what it returns when I call it. I should look up the API documentation instead, but I'm still peeved about Javadoc not working. I just need to do a reinstall. All righty, check it out. When we call dot set, it returns the old value. That's fascinating to me. I did not realize, and I'm not sure why I care about the old value, right? If I say change element number two, why do I care what element two was? But we have that option. All right, I'm going to get rid of that print line now and just leave it to names.set. Right. What happens if you set a value that doesn't exist? What do I mean by that? The index is wrong, right? We do not have 11 elements in there, so we absolutely cannot change index 10. And it blew up, right? Out of bounds. 
So if you try to manipulate elements that are past the end of the array list, it'll blow up. Or if you try to use a negative value, right? just like arrays. Can't access an array element that's past the end of the array or a negative value. Unlike Python, where you can do your minus one as your index and I'll access the last element and so on, which is just about the coolest functionality in the world. So no negative values, no values that are equal to the length or greater. What do I mean by that? If our list is four elements long, we can only set dot set elements zero, one, two, th or three. I'm going to change that back to zero. I'm going to add a comment about what we're doing. Replace the first element in the list with a new value. And we may as well print the list out at this time, just to make sure that it works. Right. Copy that and paste it. All right, we may have done about enough here. Sure, we can go a little bit longer, but we pretty much have seen all the functionality we need except how to get the size of the list. The size of the list is important so that you can compare it to the index that you're trying to access so that you do not get an exception, right? So, int space length underscore of underscore list or names Right? Or how about just int space number of names equals names dot size. In parentheses in parentheses. Notice it's not dot length. It was dot length when we were talking about strings. It was dot length when we were talking about arrays. But woo we all of a sudden we we're talking about dot size. Why did they change that? Well, the only reason I can think of is because not every collection type has a length specifically. It would have a number of elements, but for example, there's something called a map or mapping or a dictionary. It's not an ordered list, right? So they're not all just lined up in a row ready to be accessed, you know, by number, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So asking for the length of an amorphous blob of names or you know elements whatever does not really make sense but you could ask for the size of the dictionary it would tell you the number of the elements in there even though you know they're not really considered a linear structure so dot size dot size will work for pretty much all the collections whether you're using dictionaries or array lists or whatever we may as well print that out system dot out dot print ln parentheses quote number of names in list equals space end quote plus I made that variable name too long plus number of names in parentheses semicolon we ought to see four we've been haven't removed anything recently well I, I guess we did we removed Han so our list would have been three at that point. We tried to remove something that didn't exist. So we'll see three names there. There we go. Abbott, Anakin, and Tarkin. Number of names in list is three. Going back to our notepad. How to allocate a list. You know, so you use Array list parentheses type in parentheses name equals new array list angle brace end brace open parentheses close that's how you do it. I'm going to change the, that to list name and then when we want to append something to it we call dot add or dot get or dot remove or dot size this name dot size. So if you add, you can add an element, right? You can get something at a specified index. You can remove something at a specified index. 
Or you can remove something by its object, right? Like that. Either one of those works. Size doesn't accept any arguments. And dot set. List name dot set by its index, comma, and then the new element value. If I want you to remember anything about array lists, I want you to remember those. There are other methods, like dot clear, which would wipe out the list entirely. Delete everything in the list. Those are real important stuff. We might make a comment that dot remove returns true or false. Returns true or false based on whether the item existed, the element existed. And we'll make one more comment. Program will generate an exception, possibly crash, especially if there's no exception handling. If index is an invalid value, which is why dot size is a very useful thing to have. You check the size of it. The user asked to delete element six, but if the size of it returned four, yeah, you better not get six. All right, have us some homework over these concepts. Write a program that declares and allocates, right? Declares and creates an array list of strings. Ask the user, what are we going to call our strings? Color list, right? Variable name should be color list. How about just colors? As a user, or three colors to add to the list. Dot add them to the list. Then we're going to add our cool favorite color. To the list ourselves because we may not have it may not have been in there. Oh, I forgot to mention index of. Index of is the one that returns the index value of a position. I mean, of an element in the list. So, list name dot index of parentheses returns index of requested element. Or minus one if not found. Then check to see if the color purple is in the list using dot index of. If it is not, use dot add parentheses zero comma quote purple in parentheses right to insert that color into the beginning then just because we're jerks we think our program we think we're smarter than the second one yeah let's uh we're not going to be jerks. We're just going to call dot remove, right? We're going to ask them for a value. Ask the, let, let's print the colors out. Then ask the user for a color to remove from the list. Call dot remove to do so. Print the list again. Is that enough? Yeah, I think so.
We've demonstrated all these concepts. The only thing we didn't show is how to print the list with a for loop. Printing a list with a for loop is as easy as doing this. If it's a list, a, a list of strings, for example, for parentheses string value colon list in parentheses just a dot out dot print ln value, right? just like we did with arrays. You can use for each on lists just like you can with arrays. Absolutely no difference in the syntax. I'm going to add that as a comment up here. You can use a for each loop to print an array list just like you can an array. All right, hope that makes sense. Next time we'll do a little bit more with array lists and then I believe we'll switch gears and do dictionaries or stacks. Stacks are also cool. Or queues. Queues are also cool. So we have several different collection types that we're going to examine. And not all of them are really covered in the book. Or if they are covered, well, I'm going to cover them more thoroughly. So that's upcoming. Next, we talk about maps, which are dictionaries. queues, and stacks. And there's all sorts of collections. Not just maps, queues, and stacks. All sorts of collections. Linked list is a collection. Um, there's probably one called vector, just like there is in C++. In fact, most of these are probably implemented behind the scenes using a vector. Anyways, that's our homework. I will upload the notes as well, of course. And I'll see you next lecture.